am Mike Davis, Commissioner of Public Works for the City of Los Angeles and also Chairman of our African American Heritage Month uh, program. As you know, in 2019, we've been very fortunate to have a kickoff celebration that was extremely successful. And this year, we were able to honor six-time Grammy Award winner B.B. Winans uh, as our living legend this year. Also, in terms of education, we honored Dr. Wanda Austin, who is the first African-American and first woman to be president of University of Southern California. And in law, we were very fortunate to honor uh, Ken Kenneth Brazil, the Honorable Kenneth Brazil, who is the first African-American to be the presiding judge of Los Angeles Superior Court. And finally, in terms of business and corporate America achievement today, we were able to honor Ken McNeely, who is the president of AT&T West, which includes 19 states in the country uh, in which he provides leadership for that communication company. So today we are very pleased to be joined by some of the outstanding scholars of African American history in Los Angeles and also with our Master of Ceremonies for today. Uh, no one really needs an introduction uh, for him. We watch him every day on Channel 7. Uh, he's a Los Angelinos, Mr. Mark Brown. And I will introduce them one more time before when we get started, but with that, it is my honor to introduce to you the president of our Author Study Club, which is the chapter of Carter G. Woodson's uh, Negro uh, History Week uh, Committee uh, that was developed into Negro History Month, African American Heritage Month, Black History Month, all of those uh, names which we have transitioned to. Uh, this group, our Author Study Club here in Los Angeles, started this very project back in the late 1940s, after World War II, somewhere around 1948 and 1949. And when I heard about the project, I was very surprised because I was unfamiliar with the mayor they were talking about, Fletcher Bowen, who was the mayor during the time in which this project was started. It is an honor and it is a privilege for me to introduce to you the president of our Author Study Club. They are still celebrating Black History Month with the mayor of Los Angeles. Welcome the president of our Author Study Club, Ms. Ernestine Gordon. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Uh, one of our goals uh, as um, a branch of the uh, Association for the Study of African American Life and History in, as Mike mentioned uh, in Washington, D.C., is to disseminate information. Our mission is to uh, study, research, and disseminate and preserve our history. And that's the reason that Carter G. Woodson started uh, the um, organization back in 1915 in the first place, was because we had no way to uh, gather our uh, black history, our history, or to share it, or to get it published. So that's what him and his colleagues did. And, and so now it's been 104 years, and we're still here at uh, the national office. We ourselves locally will be celebrating 75 years next year. But uh, it is indeed my privilege to always talk about history and to represent our Arthur Study Club locally and to be here to hear the educators talk about uh, the national black theme. Now, I'm not sure what you know, what, what you guys will share. But uh, this year, it is talking about black migrations. Some of you might say, well, you know, that doesn't sound very interesting. But it's really very critical because uh, last year in 2018, Congressman uh, Scott uh, commissioned um, 400 years of perseverance uh, by blacks. And so it's very important. Uh, I will make sure that you get the uh, number so you can look it up and uh, see that this uh, Bobby Scott did uh, publish. And he's talking, he did uh, act, um, legislate that act. And he's talking about from 1619 to 2019, 400 years of perseverance. And that's very critical because perseverance has brought us to where you all are, where we all are where your parents came from, where you came from. And when we talk about the perseverance, they say, well, you know, you, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Well, Martin Luther 
King said, you need to have a pair of boots in order to do that. But I say, too, that it's hard to pull yourself up by your bootstraps with somebody's foot on your back. But we have done that. We have, we have wiggled and struggled and, and, <clears throat> and um, dealt with barriers and, and overcome that. So it is my pleasure to uh, welcome all of you here for this evening and, um, and the panelists and our commentator, uh, Mark Brown. We are really indeed honored. So um, we will have a wonderful event and I think that uh, they will be able to ask questions later. Is that right? Okay. okay. Have a great time. Thank you. <clears throat> As we look at city government today, one of the things that is important is recognizing the diversity of the uh, commissions that the mayor makes. And we're very pleased that African Americans are a part of those who have been appointed to commissions for the city. It is my honor to present for brief remarks and greetings uh, on behalf of the commission of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, uh, Jackie DuPont Walker, our commissioner of transportation. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Davis. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but uh, now under the administration of uh, Mayor uh, Eric Garcetti, uh, there are commissioners well-placed in places where there is money to be spent. Uh, we have chairpersons, um, uh, which are very important to the life of the departments in the city. Commissioner Davis serves as the titular chair of the black commissioners. And so he calls us together so that we can be sure that we're on the same agenda as it relates to the black community. It is my honor and my privilege to be here to say thank you to our author study club uh, for the consistency and making sure that we remember from whence we've come. To Commissioner Davis, thank you for the work you do every year. I'm sure it was not in your job description, but you do it with such fanfare. To Mr. Brown and to the panel, Thank you for challenging us to be here. Um, Mayor Garcetti has said from the very beginning that it is not Los Angeles and the other 87 cities, but it is all the 88 cities together. And he has carried that theme out. And so as we look today, I actually drove here. I want to announce that we have solved congestion. We have solved the congestion problem. I actually drove from CSUN here in 28 minutes at 5 o'clock. Wow. Unheard of. And I'm glad to say as part of Metro that we did it. <laughs> Don't ask tomorrow. Okay. Uh, but I, I think for all of us, we are looking to see how we can make this a place better than we found it. And that when we leave, that the young people who we touch will know more about their history, the African diaspora, that we would have come together. Because what we really know is that when you talk about black history, you're talking about the history of humankind. Because what happened in 10,000 BC? That's what we trace back to the human species. And so our history is world history. And I'm sure that's why in our DNA, whenever there is discrimination, whenever there is racism, whenever there's sexism and all the isms, that we're willing to stand forward because we truly understand that God put us here to do that. And so to my brothers and sisters, I'm honored to be here with you. Thank you for all that you do. And thank you to those who are consistent. And as Mayor Garcetti said, we help us to be resilient. Uh, today, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our distinguished panel. Uh, many of you know some of these scholars because you have either children who go to the universities uh, that they are uh, employees and work at and do their scholarship, and then others of you have seen them at various programs throughout our region. Uh, the first person that I would like to introduce to you comes from uh, the school, that other school, since I went to USC, I call it the other school. <laughs> and we are very proud of all of the scholars here, and we're very proud of this young man. I think he did a lot of work in Philadelphia, if yes, I'm not mistaken. Uh -huh. mistaken. And this is Dr. Marcus Hunter, who is the chairman of African American <laughs> Studies at UCLA, University of California at Los Angeles. Also, we have uh, at California State University, Long Beach, uh, Dr. Malanga Karanga is sick and under the weather, but we have a very capable scholar uh, who um, is a person who has participated before in this panel, Dr. Natalie Sarton, uh, who is a professor of Africana Studies at California State University, Long Beach. Thank you. 
also at the California State University Dominguez Hills is a distinguished chair of African, Africana Studies uh, there, Dr. Donna Nicole. At, from California State University Northridge, the director of the Southern California Studies Center, Dr. Boris Ricks. And once again, our host, our master of ceremony, he is the co-anchor of ABC7, Eyewitness News at 5 and 11. He joined ABC in 1989 as a reporter and weekend anchor. He was born in Los Angeles, for those who did not, did not know it, and he attended Narbonne High School, graduated from the University of Southern California as well, and got his bachelor's degree in broadcast journalism. He is the, his first uh, on-air job was in Eureka, California, and he went on to work as a reporter and anchor at KOLO in Reno, Nevada, and also at KNTV in San Jose, as well as KFMB TV in San Diego. He has won four Emmys, a Golden Mic, an Associated Press Award, and a Radio and Television News Directors Association Award for excellence in TV news reporting. He sits on the University of California's Board of Counselors for the Anningburg School of Communication. Welcome our Master of Ceremony, Mark Brown. Before Mark starts, I want to talk about the rules of the road and we'll try to follow those. Tonight, we will address the impact of black migration in the country and in Los Angeles. Human rights efforts and transformative resistant activities will be discussed as we consider where African Americans have made progress in education, economics, politics, and in other current events. Each scholar is asked to give their answers within two minutes of each question in order to keep the program moving and to also address each item on our agenda this evening. Finally, we will also have questions and answers from the audience uh, with following the panel uh, discussion. Closing statements from each of the scholars will be one minute, and we will now begin our discussion. <coughs> and I am proud to turn the program over to our Master of Ceremonies, Mr. Mark Brown from KABC TV. Okay, let's get started. So, um, thank you, Mike Davis. And I want to let you, I've got a cold. My voice may go out at any time, but our program will continue no matter what. Uh, so we're going to talk, our, we're, first we're going to do the opening statements. Everybody gets two minutes. You can take up to two minutes if you'd like, and whatever you'd like to, uh, to talk about. Our, our subject matter today is the black migration, but we're going to have a lot of latitude, a lot of leeway in terms of the items and things that we're going to talk about. So uh, I'll begin with you, Dr. Nicole. I want to start by talking about what I'm currently working on because it actually uh, deals with black migration. I'm an educational historian and I look at the ways in which um, conservative uh, foundations and boards of trustees impact African Americans' ability to get uh, university education. And I'm currently writing a book about the first African American trustee in the California State University system. Her name was Dr. Claudia Hampton. Some of you may be familiar with her because she was the director of urban and community relations in the 1960s when LA Unified was trying to desegregate. And as the first African American and then the first woman in the nation to ever chair a board of trustees, she was really instrumental in ensuring, she used to call herself proudly the, African, the affirmative action trustee and that she was going to guard um, affirmative action and diversity programming so that we would have an opportunity to get uh, a college education. And the migration of African Americans, as most know, to, the, to California um, with the great migration of the 19, 1940s really ushered in a period in which the state had to respond. So from 1945 to roughly 1960, eight Cal State campuses came online and it was in large part because of this influx of African Americans. What a lot of people don't also realize is that because of competition between the CSU and the UC system for funding, Clark Kerr, who was the chancellor of the UC system, issued or initiated uh, the, what is it called, the California Master Plan for Higher Education. 
And the net effect of that was to divert African Americans away from the UC system and to make them all attend the community college system first. And so what we get is this kind of popular mythology that we had this all of these educational opportunities in California, but the reality is that people were diverted. Uh, people were diverted to, um, to the lower system, if you want to call it that. So this migration, and I'm going to wrap it up, uh, but this migration forced the state to have to deal with African Americans de making strident demands for education. And so a lot of what we can owe to these changes in diversity within the Cal State system, and, and in part to the UC system as well, was because of the migration of African Americans into the state. Dr. Hunter. Hi, everybody. Uh, good evening. Thank you for coming out. Thank you to Commissioner Davis for the kind invitation. Uh, we'll talk a lot, and so I just want to start off with a simple principle. So I was uh, raised in the black <clears throat> church, and we read our Bible all the time, and so I've uh, recently, when my co-author, Zandra Robinson, come to a reformation of one of the key principles of black church spirituality, and that is wherever two or more black people are gathered, there is a chocolate city, in the words of George Clinton. <laughs> that means that right now I feel like we're in a chocolate city. And I think uh, on the issue of migration, part of it is that we all reflect the effects of black people being in movement and in motion. You know, as soon as black people get a chance, they move and go places. And so our own genealogies and lives really reflect the power of black people's ability when made available to go somewhere else, you know, to see another place, to raise a family in different contexts, to be connected to people in the Delta and be in Chicago <laughs> and move to Los Angeles. And I think that that particular kind of migration or what I call chocolate city formation <laughs> really does dictate where everybody else goes. So you you want to know where uh, white people are moving, find out where black people just went, you know, and they're moving <laughs> away from that, you know. Um, you want to find out why black people are moving, look at the policies that insinuate white families into black communities, and then you have a better understanding there. So I think not only wherever two or more black people are gathered is there a chocolate city, but wherever there's a chocolate city, there are chocolate city problems. There are people surveilling the chocolate city. There are people who are putting policies against it. And so what you wind up seeing over time is that they pop up like the Harlem Renaissance and then they disappear. Where do they go? They pop up in Atlanta and Tyler Perry Studios and then maybe they disappear. But that larger story I think is one that demonstrates the power and some of the problems that come with black migration. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sartek. Sure, good evening everyone. Thank you. I also want to thank the commissioner for the opportunity to serve on this panel um, and also all of you to, um, for joining us this evening. Um, let's see, I want to share a little bit about myself. Uh, my areas of interest are education and also uh, English. Um, my dissertation uh, concerned, uh, well, I studied some of the works of Anna Julia Cooper and Francis Harper, two activist educators. and. Uh, my goal of essentially studying their works was to actually pull from their work a pedagogy or actually practices and methods, teaching practices and methods that we could apply um, to teach in our black youth today or black students today. Um, let's see, in terms of migration, I, um, I think whenever, especially black people, to migrate to a place, um, black people are migrating there to progress. And so today I'm hoping the discussion, um, we talk about again ways that um, we ensure that black people don't stay stagnant and that they continue to progress. So, thank you. Dr. Boris Ricks. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Davis and the other commissioners here and everyone else for um, putting together such an amazing event. It looks like, it sounds like, yeah, uh, there you go. okay, there we go, <laughs> for putting together such an amazing event. So, uh, let me just uh, uh, quickly uh, introduce myself and uh, intersect that with this theme. Uh, I'm a political scientist and uh, how migration uh, intersects in my work is I look at uh, black elected officials and their leadership styles and how they uh, are able to what I'm going to call persevere. So it's called black electoral perseverance. And Los Angeles is a very interesting city when you're looking at studying uh, black elected officials and migration and population changes. 
one would think that um, with the uh, population shifts as they have transpired in Los Angeles, as it was so eloquently mentioned from the 1945 to 1960s migrations, uh, we've seen some things uh, transpire in Los Angeles, and I'm just going to raise three points. At one time, the heart of the black community in Los Angeles was Central Avenue. Central Avenue was the heart of the black community, and the black community at its highest population was about 11.7 percent, almost 12 percent. It's the highest the black population has been in the city of Los Angeles, almost 12 percent. Uh, the migration pattern has since seen African Americans moving from the east to the west. And moving from the east to the west, uh, the current heart of the black community is now Crenshaw Avenue. The black population in the city is 9 percent. There's been a 3 percent drop in the black population in the city. However, what has uniquely transpired is there have been three out of 15 council seats that have been sustained by African Americans since 1961, uninterrupted. What I mean by uninterrupted is there has not been another racial or ethnic group that has unseated the African American seats in those three council seats. So three out of 15 is 20 percent. So African Americans represent 20 percent of electoral leadership in the city and they only represent 9% in the population at this particular time. So how does that happen? And the recent work I'm doing, I've seen that there is no other city that has had a uh, grasp uh, of council seats for that significant period of time. Uh, we're talking about a 50-year span. So what happens? Uh, how has black political leadership been able to sustain itself? It's been uh, partly due to the uh, informal institutions and some of the formal institutions within the community to help to sustain that political leadership. Of course, i.e. the black church has been mentioned, uh, black community-based organizations, and uh, you know, black uh, political activism from a grassroots perspective. So those things have been very, very significant in maintaining and sustaining uh, black political leadership in Los Angeles in the midst of changing demographics and shifting migration patterns. Okay. Joining us now, uh, Dr. Jody Armour from the USC Gould School of Law. Nice to have you here. We're at the opening uh, portion of our program, and so if you want to, by way of introduction and perhaps uh, touch on our topic of uh, black migration, in Los Angeles, that's, you know, if you'd like to, or? Sure. It's been a little while, good to see you. That's good to see you. Um, black migration in, in Los Angeles, of course, I migrated like many to Los Angeles. I'm a USC law professor. I've been teaching at SC for 22 years. Uh, the Roy P. Crocker professor, I specialize in criminal law and tort law, critical race theory. From a critical race theory standpoint, the project I've been working on for the last several years and the one I always want to talk about in the beginning, in the middle, and at the, at the end is racialized mass incarceration, the so-called new Jim Crow. That, and, and if we want to talk about migration patterns, there's been a mass migration from civil life into prisons and into jail cells by blacks over the last 30 years. Right, and that migration pattern has been an involuntarily imposed one, but it hasn't always been one imposed from the outside, external to our community. We impose that migration pattern on ourselves through a lot of our attitudes toward blame and punishment in the 80s, 90s, and aughts. When they do the polls, when you look at the polls, you have black folk in the 90s. I have a 96 poll I just put in my book. 80% um, of the blacks polled said they wanted more prisons built. 75% said they wanted more uh, police on the street. 70% uh, said they wanted longer prison sentences. Mike has heard me talking about this for a long time. You know, when I first got here 20 years ago, before people were really, got, uh, were really humming about it, like they started after Michelle Alexander's New Jim Crow in 2010, started people thinking about this as a, as a social justice issue, rather than just bad people making bad choices. 
Uh, so I, I'd like to talk more about that as we go on and, and how we stem that migration pattern and turn it around and have it going the other way. Okay. Thank you. All right, so we've heard their opening statements. We've touched on the issue of, of black migration, but we want to touch on that a little further in terms of, you know, uh, this is, it's, it's been the greatest mass movement of people in human history. The, mig the migration of African Americans from the rural South into the cities in the North and the Midwest and the East. And so we want to look at, thank you, we want to look at uh, what impact it has had on civic life, on politics, on culture, and just kind of delve into that a little bit about, uh, and, and you have two minutes each, who'd like to, who'd like to begin? Yeah, uh, I'll start just by saying uh, that's, right and part of what you wind up seeing at least with black history is that it shows up in the culture and so for example when i uh, teach a class at ucla it's called uh, the social organization of black communities uh, i often start with uh, after we start with slavery black reconstruction and then thinking about the great migration um, and so what i try to uh, demonstrate to the students that it's also what we can think of as a long migration, meaning black people are still moving for a lot of the same reasons. So in 1922, uh, the Chicago <coughs> Commission did a poll of recent Southern migrants. And in 1924, Philadelphia did the same thing. 1926, New York does the same thing because they're going, all of these black people, where are they coming from? Who are they? What are they doing? And so you see all of these urban areas asking actual poll questions and going and getting surveys from folks to get some demographic information. And what they often say is freedom to vote freedom to look for a good job. All of these ideas that we all know fast forward uh, to the present, they did not find in these places, right? So these are freedoms unfulfilled, and what happens is those freedom dreams, as Robin Kelly teaches us, are passed down to their children. The next generation then has these kinds of experiences, and a good place to think about would be somewhere like Black Appalachia. You know, you get recruited from Alabama into Kentucky, and then about one generation, those kids who grew up with their parents working, you know, in the minors, uh, they're like, oh, I don't want to live in Kentucky. You know, they hear about a friend who's moved to New York and has got a good job. And so you fast forward, part of what you wind up seeing is, and I imagine in the room, people's individual biographies looking like what Stevie Wonder called living for the city. You know, Midnight Train to Georgia, Hollywood by Rufus Feature and Shaka Khan. That the, the culture reproduces the narratives and why they become hits is because people are living it. You know, the boy is born in the heart of Mississippi, you know, by the end of it, he's on a bus and it goes, the, the song goes off on the radio. But if you're still listening to the project, you know, what you hear is, welcome to New York City. And then he's getting out of the bus, hey, N word here, N word here. All of a sudden, police, arrest, you know, and you're thinking, not a blind man, Stevie wonder getting off the bus that's everybody can get it then so the idea is he's leaving with his entire family putting all of their needs on the line so he can actually go to this place where freedom happens in this case is the north and what he finds is the new south so to speak and I think that's an important way to also understand black migration is the hope for the north and only finding a new south wow powerful okay. I can't Anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> I think you summed it up. Would you want to address it? Anyone? All right, we're going to move on. We just had a, a teacher strike. Luckily, it was a short one, the first one in 30 years, but it demonstrated um, to me uh, a great inequity. Uh, versus in, in, when you look at the, what the, one of the, the biggest issues was class size, and they wanted to keep it from being 39 students in a class. When, and, and the optimum at the moment is 36, I guess, in elementary. And you compare that to some of the top private elementary schools in Los Angeles where there might be two teachers in a class with 17 students. Mm -hmm. um, what does the role of education and what is the impact of these sorts of inequities, both regionally and public-private charter, uh, what are the effects, do you think, and what, are the, what, what sorts of ramifications are they having? Educators, yeah. all. Yeah. I'll, I'll take it on. Oh, please do. I think it's really important to uh, understand the critical role uh, of education, as certainly and certainly public education. Unfortunately, uh, in this country, education has been uh, framed as a privilege as opposed to a right. 
let me repeat that, education has been framed as a privilege as opposed to a right. Uh, and since the passage of Brown v. Board and the second Brown case, we've seen a number of school districts that have chosen to, um, to not abide by the uh, findings in Brown. Mm -hmm. So what they've done, they have, uh, they have segregated their schools in interesting fashion. For example, I went to school in Mississippi. What Mississippi did, Mississippi created uh, a parochial private school system to, uh, to prevent the state from um, abiding by the laws that were, uh, that were created in Brown versus Board of Education. So what Mississippi did is bypassed integrating schools and created their own system for white students. These white parochial schools were, are some of the best schools in the South. And uh, African Americans were not allowed to attend these schools. And interestingly enough, not until the late 80s did they start to admit African Americans in the schools. And you probably know why they started to admit African Americans in these high schools, right? Because African Americans were the way for these high schools to win sporting events, i.e. basketball games, football games, baseball games, and et cetera. So the black elite athlete in the community was able to attend the private parochial school in Mississippi. Now, not only did Mississippi do this, but other southern states did this as well and mimicked Mississippi. So you have public schools in the south that have African Americans who basically um, don't have a quality education uh, and you have private parochial schools that have excellent resources. And uh, the ratios that were mentioned earlier, some of those ratios, um, 17 students in a classroom. So what happens? Because of educational opportunities, African Americans in the South migrated north and west. They migrated north and west for better educational opportunities, and of course that led to you know, uh, better economic opportunities. Uh, lo and behold, uh, that may not have provided these communities with exactly what they were looking for. In coming to California and looking at public schools in Los Angeles, how did Los Angeles deal with the issue of um, public education? Los Angeles created a busing system and magnet schools, mm -hmm. right? So magnet schools were the way for Los Angeles Unified School District to resolve the issue as it related to busing and, and school integration. So what did that essentially mean? You took the best and brightest students of color from their neighborhood schools and they were bused to schools uh, in uh, i.e. the valleys and et cetera. So this essentially uh, resegregated the schools and created an imbalance that's pretty interesting right now. So I'll say this and I'll, I'll end. If every African American student went to their home schools, you know the schools that would have the majority black populations? You know the schools that would have the best athletic teams in, in, in the city of Los Angeles? The schools that of course are in what was formerly known as the Southern League. Now some of you all went to those Southern League schools. Manual Arts High School, Jefferson High School, Fremont High School, Locke High School, Los Angeles High School. Those schools would have the, those <coughs> schools would, would have the, the largest African American student populations. They would have the best sporting event, sporting teams and et cetera, right? So we can see how segregation and getting around the rules, uh, uh, getting around the rules of, from integrating schools as a result of Brown v. Board has had significant impact on schools, not only in the South, but in uh, the West as well. One thing's for sure, the, the deplorable <laughs> state of our schools, the atrocious state of many of our public schools. I've had three boys and had to think about the public school system a lot and had them in the public schools so that I wasn't just yakking it, about it, but walking the walk. But the, the, the deplorable condition of some of our public schools makes it, it should make us ashamed 
and it should make us, it impossible for us to wag our fingers at our young people and say, just pull up your pants and go to school and do what you're supposed to do and you can get the American dream. Horatio Alger's right there for you. Just, you, here, here's the legitimate means to the American dream, education. You do education, you get to the American dream, which is some kind of material prosperity at least. Some kind of, at least you're going to have some minimal level of material comfort as part of the material, uh, or rather American dream. Um, I have, I live around the corner in View Park. Um, my, the high school that my kids would normally have gone to would have been Crenshaw High. Um, and we came in, nine, in, in early, in mid-90s, so I had a lot of the kids from Crenshaw High coming over to my home doing art and justice stuff with USC. So I got to know these kids, and I got to see the impact on these kids in 2005, 6 when Crenshaw lost its accreditation. So here are kids who'd done everything they were supposed to do, played by the rules, did, and at the end of the process got a diploma that was essentially worth toilet paper in the admissions process because it was coming from an unaccredited school. And I talked to admissions officers about that, mm -hmm. right? And so now the, the, they see it's all a cruel hoax. Not only do they recognize it's a cruel hoax, but the 11th graders, 10th graders, 9th graders all are looking up and saying, that was just, that was just you know, bamboozling. You, we were just being bamboozled. And, and, and then we wonder when they figure it out and say, hey, ain't nothing wrong with my aim. I just got to change my target, mm -hmm. right? I'm still going to seek the American dream, but I'm not going to be able to go the, through the legitimate means because the education system isn't there for that. So now I'm out here with, with beige rocks in my palm under a lamppost trying to hustle for self-respect and dignity, and all you can do is berate me and call me an N-word. When you failed me, I didn't have any control over that school system. Yeah. Yes. Let, let me add to it. In terms of education, <laughs> teachers are held with the responsibility to educate children. They are measured by their learning through tests. And if teachers are to be responsible for the learning of students, studies have already proven that classroom size is a tool by which they can learn better if they don't have an overload of students. So the accomplishment of the school, uh, of the union, to get smaller classroom sizes is to help the, the teachers to do their jobs better, which is to be responsible and to increase the learning of students. So if you're giving me 40 and 50 students, I can't do my job as a teacher as effectively as I can when mm -hmm. it's a smaller classroom size. Mm -hmm. Um, and I agree, too, to your question about um, LA Unified School District. Certainly that was a victory for LAUSD. However, I do think we still need a type of education, uh, really overhaul or education reform. And um, I'm reminded as we're talking um, uh, about, again, um, you know, again, uh, black students in education or just students within LA County and the kind of education they get. And I think the question is, is what are we educating them for? And so um, I'm reminded of Anna Julia Cooper, and she, um, again, an overhaul would look like, or some sort of new curriculum and also pedagogies would look like an education that educated students, um, their heart, their head, and their mind. And so it didn't just provide knowledge, it provided also ethics and values. Um, because again, one day they're going out into the world and we want them to be good people. We want them to do good things. We want them to think about others. We want them to address the issues in our community. And certainly, too, in terms of the occupative, you know, often that's taken out of schools. And uh, Cooper did feel that uh, an occupative meaning technical programs, you know, that used to exist in high schools. And certainly she felt that that was secondary to the intellect or what she called classical education, that first they needed to actually learn, um, you know, how to develop their mind. And then they can learn the occupative. And part of her reasoning was, she said, because, you know, we don't want to, um, we don't want to just teach the occupative because then they're no different from the mule, right? We need to teach them first, you know, uh, build their mind, and then they can create these wonderful things and learn how to use their hands as well. But I do think that um, I, she offers a good model for um, education reform and the way in which we should actually be <coughs> educating students. And certainly her plan was to educate all students. So, and also, um, I believe she said something to their ability. And so therefore, you know, again, we're not leaving anyone behind. And 
Lastly, um, a, long, a while ago, Dr. Karenga shared a, a text with me, Dr. Malana Karenga, and it, it is W.E.B. Du Bois' um, text he wrote in 1933, I believe. Um, the, um, it is titled the, um, um, the, it, he's offering this model for black colleges in terms of education, but Du Bois offers, at the, the start of this text, he, it, it's just this beautiful sort of narrative of what he sees as the ideal um, educational system, and he starts in this um, small village in a country in Africa, and he said, in this village, you have um, children. When they're raised, they, they accompany their parents, and they learn the land. They learn the appreciation of the land. They learn the river, and so they learn those skills. And then secondly, children, um, as they grow older, they're taken, they're separated, male and female, and they learn how to, um, you know, again, how to raise a family, how to in addition, kind of follow those cultures and those values in terms of being male and female. And then when they're of age, they come together and they, they marry. And then the children, you know, when the children of age, they marry. And then at that point, education doesn't stop. They actually sit with the elders and they learn the wisdom of that village. And so in a sense, Du Bois was saying that at the end of this educational process, there's no education that's not of value to the community. Everything they're learning is of value too you know, the community and can be reused. And again, it's to withhold this, um, you know, those, the, the values and the traditions and the culture of that community. Yeah, so I do think we need to think in that fashion. Yeah. Well, what I'm gonna say about um, public education because it's tied to K-12 is that in the late, well, the mid to late 80s, um, how many of you have ever heard of the culture wars? So the academic culture wars were really in full swing by 1990, but um, what a lot of people don't know uh, <laughs> is that how much conservative foundations gave to try to initiate the culture wars. And so, you know, Ward Connerly, who was like the chief architect of Proposition 209, was paid $2.1 million uh, to launch that campaign in 1994 alone. And so I think that these conservative foundations that pushed a particular type of education that Reagan was actually uh, endorsing what he called mandate for change, which was the high stakes testing, the proficiency test, uh, instead of teaching students uh, soft skills that they would be able to transfer to other types of um, jobs if, if ca in case one industry doesn't last, you can go somewhere else. And I think we need to be mindful of the assault to education that comes from, with, comes from outside of it and how K-12 is affected by this. If you're dependent on conservative dollars, if charter schools are dependent on money from outsiders, what kind of education can you get when you are codependent on someone else for money? And so I think that that has had a really devastating impact on students. I trace how this money affected uh, black studies programs in particular. There was this kind of uh, delegitimizing black studies in the 80s and 90s, and a lot of that followed money. So this kind of orchestrated attempt to keep students from finding the thing that would make them feel connected to their educations. You know, when we get the students often in uh, higher education, we're the first conversation that they were having, meaningful conversation they're having about African American history. You know, the, the law was passed to institute um, ethnic studies and Cal State Dominguez is working on trying to create an ethnic studies you know, program within our master's degree in education, but look how long this has taken. And if you look at the, the curriculum that's proposed, Black people don't start until 1945 in that curriculum. So you have to say, why is it that we don't, our conversations don't start until 45? And it may have something to do with who's funding that curriculum. Mm -hmm. When we talk about funding, when we talk about economics, we talk about jobs, um, the conversation can shift to, to, to the public sector, which has often been an, an area where African Americans have, have found employment, found stability, uh, a measure of, of safety in, in, in effect that you, you know, uh, these are stable jobs. 
Uh, it's a two-pronged question. Um, are African Americans receiving the fair share of public sector, sector job opportunities? And two, are those jobs as safe as they used to be? And I'm looking, of course, at what happened in Washington, D.C., that 35-day shutdown. Anyone? Well, I can tell you as a practitioner of government, I can tell you as we look at the numbers in the city of Los Angeles that the data does not reveal that there have been an ample share of the jobs, specifically in the African-American community. During the affirmative action era in the 80s, during the time in which Tom Bradley was in, we had policies that perpetuated the support of inclusion. We had approximately 15 percent of minorities and African-Americans having city contracts. In 1996, we had the implementation of Proposition 209 that not only impacted higher education, but it also impacted government jobs, and most importantly, government contracts. It was proposed to be a civil rights initiative that was going to be inclusive of all. It was more of a colorblind philosophy uh, without regard to gender and or race. Uh, anybody who competed, it would be fairly selected. The data now shows us, in terms of contracting in the city of Los Angeles, that we are not even 1% of the contracts for the city of Los Angeles. In particular, African Americans are 0.23% of those who get contracts. So if you talk about where we are in terms of data uh, as far as African Americans having contracts, we are 7%, 7.1% of the population of those in the area, in the county area of African American jobs to be selected from, and again, only 0.23% of those who've actually gotten the jobs. So in light of what we learned about the city's political leadership, <laughs> how we are overrepresented in city council, how we are 7% of the population, how does that happen? It's, it's, as, as a matter of fact, it's rather paradoxical because one of the things that, um, that uh, is confounding is, you know, this percentage, you know, representing 20 percent of elected leadership. However, if we look at the breakdown of employees within the city, if we look at the number of African American commissioners within the city, <coughs> we'll see that there is some disproportionality as it relates to the population, right? It's not proportional. So one of the things is on one hand, you have overrepresentation in elected leadership. Now, that's because African Americans and coalition politics of the 90s have still been able to prevail. However, as it relates to employment within the county and employment within the city, uh, we're underrepresented. And, and, and that can be uh, somewhat disconcerting because, as is, is mentioned, um, those migration patterns, those uh, African Americans who came west from Louisiana and Texas and came to California and made California home, they relied on civil service jobs. Civil service jobs were the way they were able to sustain themselves and their families up until uh, the 60s, early 70s. And those civil service jobs were how they were able to purchase homes and then, of course, send their children to to colleges so that their children can uh, actually do better than them because of civil service jobs. Civil service jobs at the county level, civil service jobs at the city level. I'm not really sure that is the case today, and we should probably ask that question. I, I think uh, Professor Hunter is correct. What we have discovered is a new South. And it's not necessarily the representation we have at the policy level. It's, in fact, the policies themselves. Mm -hmm. It is, what is the aftermath of Proposition 209? That supersedes who you have sitting in the seat on the council, because now it becomes law. So this is, in fact, uh, as we reflect back, what we have discovered, that how is this any different than some of the old rules that we have seen generations ago? Right. Yeah, there's a. Uh really great documentary that uh, James Baldwin did 
called uh, Take This Hammer. Mm -hmm. uh, it came on in the Bay Area in 1964, February, Black History Month then. Um, and it was uh, filmed just after uh, the September bombing of the church in Birmingham where the four little girls were murdered. And uh, the public works folks went to him and said, you know, you can go anywhere in America and uh, film something about black life, particularly in the aftermath of this like horrible racial act of terrorism. And he chooses San Francisco. And so we're talking about a San Francisco where people are recently arrived from Texas and recently arrived from Louisiana. And so the idea of the South is a lived experience. They're not unfamiliar with it. And so the documentary opens up um, and it's a sort of classic scene from like 1960 something in terms of people talking to uh, black young people, mostly boys and men outside of a liquor store on a corner of you know, the neighborhood then that was black, uh, Bayview. And the first line is, it's worse here than it is in the South. You know, in the South, at least they putting the laws on the walls and they telling you where to go and they telling you where to eat. Mm. Over here in California, man, they getting you with that pen. They writing these laws. So fast forward to 1990 something, this dude was right then. You know, that California is a place where what you can do is just make it so that you price black people out. You don't even have to necessarily create Jim Crow if you could just make it completely too expensive to live in South Central. That's all you have to do. And in fact, that's part of what's contributing to the number of black people disappearing from Los Angeles. Many of them are returning to Texas or going to North Carolina, going to other places where the cost of living is lower. They're not necessarily leaving because, you know, you can't get a job per se. It's just that you can't get a job that makes pace with the cost of living. And also, as we noted, many times black residents of urban areas are public workers. And so then what you have is teachers got to go on strike for money, for a way to live. You have UCLA staff members who don't get enough money to live in Los Angeles. Professor, you know, so it just goes on and on. And I think a big part of it is because we need to have a larger conversation and by we, I mean black voters, but also voters more generally over what should the public mean? Like when you go to school, that should be a public service. You know, certain things should not be privatized. You know, like if you're going to incarcerate people and punish them, why is it private? You know, like, and why is the working conception that private is better than public? You know, when you go other places, which is, I think, a larger uh, issue in terms of migration, is also international migration, thinking about black people being able to get up off of this continent and go to other places. Because you can go to places that would, in terms of GDP, produce a lot less than the United States, but their airport is actually something you could take a photograph in and, and be proud, you know. <laughs> Uh, their way of getting around public transportation is a thing. You can actually go from the center of London to the airport on a train. Who would have thought of that? And then you come back here and you go, wow, this place has way more money, but the only way we're going to ever get anything that is a public good is through some privatized mechanism. Because for whatever reason, we think we can outsource better than we can insource, which is, I think, a total mindset shift that I think has serious not only uh, consequences for black employment, but serious consequences for the fact that we ride on roads that were built by people after World War II. Why is that the case? That seems really unsafe to me. These roads are 60 years old. And I mean, that's, that's really dangerous. But we kind of think, oh, we're going to fix that road. We're going to pass a law and then give that money to some private organization to build this thing for the public. That that sort of loss of public stewardship over things that we all need is a very dangerous shift that I think affects not only employment, but also how we live and get through the, the everyday traffic of Los Angeles, let alone just the, the infrastructure of the United States just collapsing. Mark, um, your, your question really gets at also uh, a, a basic truth, right, that when we're talking about public jobs, you have a, a mechanism that can be used to impose a non-discrimination norm on hiring, right? These public authorities get together and they say, we're going to recognize a non-discrimination norm and we're going to enforce it. And you get the numbers like that you were talking about, right? When we get out of that sphere of the, of the public and we say, okay, black folk, for example, and other members of socially marginalized or stereotyped groups, we're going to throw you to the unbridled discretion of the free market. Private now preferences. 
private <coughs> feelings are going to determine your fate solely. When that happens, you get that kind of, the, those plummeting numbers. When you send out the resumes, you make them resumes, you know the studies, you make the resumes otherwise the same, same quality schools, same GPAs, you just put a black sounding name on the top of the resume versus a white sounding name, and the black sounding name gets back 50% fewer positive responses, 50%. They do this over and over. That's the private market. Those are the prejudices out there, and that's what gives rise to the phenomenon you're talking about. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about politics. And as a, a, a journalist, it's really exciting to see that this new political season has begun already, and people who are, especially well, on the Democratic side at any rate, the number of people who are lining up. Uh, I've lost count so far, but there are two African Americans, and there may be more. <laughs> what do you think about that? I mean, this is a, an historic moment where there are serious, obviously, African-American candidates, and, and a lot of people are saying the lead, the person who's in the lead right now is Kamala Harris. Who do you like in 2020? What do you think about this crop of, of candidates? Who would you like to see? I'm going to ask uh, Nicole, Dr. Nicole. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> he could hear me saying I don't want to answer this question uh -huh. just yet. Uh, I'm, I am very undecided uh, in terms of the democratic field um, for a number of reasons. Um, I would like to see what um, Kamala Harris as well as Cory Booker are going to propose with regards to economics and education. Um, I'm not I'm not 100 percent clear on where they stand on these kind of issues. Um, I'm quite leery about Harris's background with regards to prosecution um, and the number of black and brown folks that were incarcerated under her watch as um, a, attorney general. So I'm reticent to fully say that I favor her, but then on the other hand, I don't really favor Booker either mm -hmm. um, because of his ties to uh, Big Pharma. So. I actually am waiting to see what the rest of the field has to say uh, because I really want to see what the policy I'm a pol I'm a policy driven voter I don't care about personality I mean per personality is part of the reason why we're in this mess right now um, and so I, I would I would like to see what they have to say on issues um, I think that what is a concern, though, is that we have to stop this, we have to stop Trumpism at the door. And I don't know if we can stop Trumpism by throwing away all the other things that are important, too, which, which is, you know, trying to reduce or get rid of prisons. And California has the largest prison system of any state. You know, for me, that's a really important issue. We built 20 some odd prisons and one university in the last, since 1990. And to me, that's a critical issue because we're losing sons and brothers and to a system that is just going to harden them when they get out. So in, in essence, I'm not ready to endorse Harris or Booker simply because they're black folks. Yeah, I, I think that Trump is going to win. I'm just very pessimistic that way uh, because uh, he doesn't have any competition to his right. Uh, they've all needed him to be reelected. Uh, the Democrats are very bad at uh, creating a bench and actually having some set of people that you have not been introduced to for the first time when a, a presidential election happens. American politics are very unpredictable, so all you need is a good two weeks in some cases. But I do think that uh, what I think is useful about what's coming up with the politics is at least even if they lose, you get to see the beginnings of a new bench, you know, that's sort of a post-Clinton scenario, which is a sad state of affairs because you would think, you know, there would be way more people for you to know. And I think oftentimes the Republicans are way better at that than the Democrats are, where you have different people who are out there. You, you hear Rand Paul, oh, what's he about? You know, you hear Trump, oh, and then you have Ted Cruz and Marco Rodriguez, all of these names that they allow to flow around even while somebody's in power 
where Democrats are very different about that. And so what happens is you have to get in love with somebody pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the candidates, uh, and this is one of my undying concerns about Bernie Sanders, is that he did not think that it was important to visit with a black church or go to a black community mm -hmm. until it was time for him to run for president. Yeah. And then they're pulling out civil rights receipts. I'm just like that, I mean, <laughs> but Trayvon Martin was killed just not too long ago. Where were you then? Yeah. You know, Mike Brown was murdered before you went up for election. Where were you then? You know, like, stop telling me you marched with, you know, Martin Luther King. That's a wonderful thing to have done and that's important. But also as someone who was not born during that time, if I had a <laughs> nickel for every person who marched with Martin Luther King, I would be a rich man paying all of us all sorts of things. So for me, it's also about what message is the Democratic Party sending to its candidates that you can be a white person running for the highest office in the land and not have to visit with black people at all until the time comes. And I think, you know, black people, we know what our choices are as voters, but we at least like to have some integrity in our vote. Like, please don't just make me feel like, oh, I got to pick you because, you know, Trump is mm -hmm. on one. Mm -hmm. At least let me feel like there's some integrity in the fact that I'm going to go in a particular place. Mm -hmm. And that's the trouble that I have, I think, thinking about the, the Democratic Party more generally, is how much integrity do they allow for the black vote? For us to feel like, oh, you came to us and, you know, you, you kissed our feet a little bit, you know, just like mm -hmm. you do when you go over to Iowa, you know, that has like 10 people, you know, like <laughs> it, it'd be nice if you were, did you come to Harlem? You know, did you come over to the news, new, Amsterdam News and sit with us and actually hear what we have to say? Have you gone to the LA Sentinel and actually listen to us, even if it's just to do what you want to do anyway? You know, it's like one of those things that I think is just about dignity, you know, that you want to feel like somebody worked a little bit for your vote and that they weren't just using the fact that the other person is a crazy, violent terrorist and all these other things as like the backdrop for your vote. Like, oh, the black women are coming with me because did you see the guy? Did you hear what the news is saying? It's like letting that do the work of collecting black votes and that's just a disgrace and also disrespectful to black voters. So I would like to see the Democratic Party uh, try harder and do better. With respect to Kamala Harris in particular, um, I, I feel, uh, I don't know, a, a special kind of responsibility because this is not only a legal area, but I um, held a, one of her early fundraisers when she was running for the Attorney General of the state. And <coughs> I knew she had a record as a prosecutor that was uh, p punitive and, con and concerning in a lot of ways. For example, cracking down on parents of truant kids with the criminal justice system and a host of other things. Um, but, you know, you, 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 you say, well, maybe that's just how you earn your bones at a certain level and you had kind of had to do it, but now you can get to this next level and you can really be yourself. And when she got to the next level, it was more of the same, only on steroids, right? She, um, you know, didn't bring any prosecutions against um, a variety of police who were caught in all kinds of misconduct. She was opposing all kinds of uh, release programs for prisoners, saying we need them to fight the fires, we need the free labor. Um, she just, uh, uh, just p policy position after policy position when it came to mass incarceration, blame and punishment. And my concern is, and I think this is her Achilles heel on this, I hope she turns it around, is she, you have to just own it rather than deny it. You know, by calling yourself a progressive prosecutor, oh, I'm a progressive prosecutor, like Larry Krasner in Philadelphia who said, I'm opposing money bail, I'm police misconduct, I'm cracking down on, 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 on bad uh, officers, and I'm uh, making deep cuts in mass incarceration. That's the platform he ran on in Philadelphia and got 75% of Philadelphians to vote for him on that platform, right? That's a progressive prosecutor. But to say you're a progressive prosecutor and not have a record anything like that is just not truth in advertising. Mm -hmm. What you gotta do is like own it. You gotta say there's been an Overton shift in 
public discourse and what's acceptable, you know, the law and order rhetoric of the 80s and 90s and aughts sounds tinny and acoustically is off today. Um, I didn't have perhaps the moral insight and courage to see at that time that we were morally obtuse, but now I recognize it and I realize it. I've, I've come around and I'm going to change and I'm going to make changes going forward. Something like that I think we could get our arms around. You know, it's honest. Let's talk about some cultural things and some of the things that are happening in the news. Um, somebody joked on Twitter, actually it was me, uh, that the new uh, motto for the state of Virginia should be blackface like me. Because, oh. um, man, it seems like everybody. Um, so you got the governor, you got, we'll talk about, we can talk about the lieutenant governor as another issue, but the, the, uh, the guy below the lieutenant governor also had a blackface issue. And I want to broaden it out, too, because this is, they're talking about, you know, what these, some might call a youthful indiscretion uh, from long ago. And during that same week, the actor Liam Neeson talked about something that he did uh, or tried to do or wanted to do when a friend of his was raped, as it turns out, by, an Af by, by a black man, and how he decided that he was going to go out and look for somebody who was going to beat him to death. And he was doing it as part of selling this movie that he's on that's talking about revenge. So um, what he's saying is that he has evolved. What these people are saying is that they have evolved. Do they get a pass? Do they, have they evolved? Is there such a thing as evolution when you're doing something in the 80s and it involved blackface? Or, or involved maybe trying to beat somebody to death? Or what, what, what should, you know, we're hearing a lot about this. What do, what do you think? I would say we need to take this on a case-by-case -case basis because the governor of Virginia still hasn't really fully admitted. Mm -hmm. You know, first it's, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sorry-ish. <laughs> then, no, that really wasn't me. And, you know, so, we, you know, he hasn't even owned it. Mm -hmm. You know, so I would be real, no. You know, like, no. We, we, there's no pass for that. You can't even say, yes, I, that was me in that, in that photograph. Um, the Liam Neeson thing is a little bit harder, f only in so much that he's admitting what we know to be true as black people living in a society that is racist and violent, that people often have those thoughts, and it's, it might just be the law or might be society that keeps people from doing these things. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm... Why I hesitate to fully let it go or give him a pass is why is the impulse to hurt any black man, why wasn't your anger targeted? Uh -huh. I don't understand why he felt like any black man would do. Uh -huh. right. You know, I, that was, that's inexplicable to me. Mm -hmm. So you are attacking a person's race and not the action that they took. So I, I haven't f felt like he's admitted that part. He has said, I had these racist ideas, and, and, and I'm a jump. The commentator, why did they ask what was the race of the person who committed the rape? Mm -hmm. that has all, that's been bothering me. Like, why was the first thing that, that sprung to mind when they were talking to him in this interview, what was the first thing, like, what was the race of the person that raped your friend? Well, that was actually the question that he asked oh, okay. when he found out about this. And right. so that, that is a clue, yeah. obviously, to his mindset, because uh, he asked him, like, why are you asking that, you know? So then do we, so if, if, he, if he first asked that question and the commentator asked that, then that's a pattern that, so should we let it go? Or I don't think so, because that means all black men are subject to violence mm -hmm. because these folks got these thoughts running through their heads. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I think um, with the governor and attorney general, um, I also agree that there's been no apology, you know, and no admittance of, you know, any sort of guilt. Um, and, and in my opinion, too, the idea of someone dressing up and uh, we, you know, had a bit of a, dis a discussion earlier, but the idea of someone, um, you know, dressing up and again painting their face in a w in in that sort of derogatory way, demeaning way, toward black people, um, yeah, I think it's inexcusable as well. Um, and and also, I I believe that they they're aware of the history. There's no excusing 
why they as adults would again, you know, engage in that sort of, you know, behavior. Mm -hmm. And, but um, yeah, and, and I, I just, yeah, I think it shows a certain mindset and I understand that it's been years prior, but again, without any sort of admittance to, you know, I've grown past this, this was wrong. You know, there's, you know, there's no need to leave, you know, you, you know, but that wasn't the person that we, ele or we elected you under false pretenses in a sense. Yeah. <coughs> There's, a, there's also another problem here. There, 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 there's a problem with the Virginia Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. I'm to tell you why there's a problem with the Virginia Democratic Party. Uh, anyone worth their weight that does decent opposition research shouldn't be able to find that out. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So here's my question. All three Did the Virginia Democratic Party, were they aware and just turned the other cheek? It seems to me that this is too simplistic for this photo to be as easily obtained as it could be obtained. And um, as good of opposition research firms as we know that are out there, and no one came across this. So this suggests to me that um, there may be a double standard. There may be a double standard, uh, uh, you know, uh, Candidate Barack Obama had to denounce Jeremiah Wright. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He had to completely denounce him. He had to completely change churches. He had to completely show a wall of separation. And uh, he may not still be black, even after having done all that, right? And so I'm a little, I'm a little concerned about this standard. I'm a little concerned about. Uh, the party politics and how the party, how party politics truly embraces um, reconciliation. Unfortunately, when Republicans win, white men in blue suits rule. When Democrats win, white men in blue suits rule. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Yeah. You know, I think there may have been a kind of shift in the Overton window. You know, they call the Overton window that um, window of what's acceptable to say in public. Uh -huh. You know, that window shifts over time. There, there, what, you, what was acceptable to say in the 70s might not be in the 2019, <coughs> right? Or in the 80s, or in the 90s. That window shifts. You know, when I started teaching at uh, USC Law School, for example, um, up until 2003, from 95 to 2003, my students were learning that it was constitutional for the government to make felons out of a same-sex couple that exchanged intimacy. Same-sex intimacy was a felony in numerous jurisdictions. I think now, when we look back and think about that, it's, it's absurd, it sounds crazy, I think, to a lot of us. It, it, it seems morally obtuse, morally blind that we would do that to our fellow citizens and neighbors, make felons out of people who are sharing same-sex intimacy. Okay, the Overton window has shifted. People making those noises then could make them very comfortably. They can't make them now. And, some of the, and so what you have now, over the last four or five years, we've, been, we've become a lot more focused on our shared symbolic life, our public symbolic life. You know, the Confederate flags, the Confederate monuments, that Black Lives Matter movement spilled over onto college campuses as the inclusion, diversity, and equity movement. And people are really thinking about the names of buildings and our shared symbolic public life. And so now, the, the, maybe back in the 80s, it was, you know, it was, it, the Overton window was different and we weren't focused as much as we are in the last four or five years on rooting that kind of stuff out. And so now, I think there's a special level of vulnerability in, for, for those folks, and I think it goes back to what I was saying at the end of our, when we were talking before. How, do you, how they deal with it has to be owning it first and foremost, not denying it, not distancing it. Yes, I was doing it back then. I was morally blind to do it back then. I didn't have the moral courage or insight back then to go against the crowd. I see the light now. I'm doing all I can to reverse the wrong that I did back then going forward. Nothing short of that. Anyone else want to weigh in on the, the blackface? Yeah, I mean, I would just say on the, the oppositional uh, uh, kind of research point, 
I think that uh, that point is well taken, but I will also say that part of what makes it more likely is that I just think that people don't know that white people lie. It's like something that black people know. <laughs> One thing that black history teaches you is that we had to understand that black people lie. You know, they will tell you to your face, I will sign those freedom papers, and the next day, you know, you're not free. And what happens, I think, in research um, and also in life, people just think whatever this white person just said is totally true. Hmm. They totally are telling the truth in a way that a black person could never get away with mm -hmm. or a woman could never get away You know, you start going down the level so that it's actually, if it's a white man, then we believe him, you know, period. Now, what's interesting about, I think, the Liam Neeson situation is it just reveals the steady diet of anti-blackness and the hate of black people produces these kinds of like crazy ideas about how to deal with the crime because we learn that one black person is a proxy for all black people mm -hmm. in a way that we're, we're taught, you know, white people are to be understood on an individual basis, you know. So, for example, I have students that I meet often and I tell them about all the ratchet things that I watch, you know, like I watch uh, all of... Think of any reality show and think about how bad it is. I'm probably, you know, recording it so I can go through the commercials and watching every last minute of it. And the students will say, well, how do you, you know, manage that as a professor? And he have these representations of black people on there. Like, you know, people are watching The Real Housewives of Atlanta and going like, this is a representation of black women in the South? That, that's a problem. And I say to them, if a person comes to me and says that they know about black people from watching The Housewives, as much as I love that show, you are telling on your own anti-blackness, mm -hmm. your own whiteness, your own belief in white supremacy because I don't watch friends and go into the world and say, I know white women now who are between the ages of 20 and 35. I know what they want to date. I know what they like to eat. We don't even, if somebody were to say that, you, people would automatically tell you it is improper to watch, you know, an episode of Sex in the City and make assumptions about 30-year-old white women in Manhattan. But people do not think that, you know, watching Love and Hip Hop is not the same as, like, understanding all black people. Yeah. And so for me, it's also just to say when people come from forward with those kind of troublesome, you know, stereotypes and feelings about black people, we should always remember that they're being fed a steady diet. You know, a steady diet produces a, a particular mindset, particular body structure, a particular way of moving through the world that we go, oh yeah, a steady diet of like white men have it the worst, white men can't get anything, or Barack Obama, so and so produces Donald Trump. You know, a steady diet of that produces the particular outcome. And I think when we look at the outcome, we should know it's also because, as I said before, they might have asked the dude, have you ever done anything that's bad? And so he might have gone, well, the black vote is in the bag in Virginia, so I ain't even thinking about them. And then they said, well, what about, you know, let's say they are savvy these days. Well, what about, you know, we have to think about these black people who are upper middle class living in, you know, the, suburb, the suburbs of Virginia. What are they going to say? I've never done anything. And they probably never looked any further. Hmm. If they asked a black candidate those same set of questions, they're like, okay, but we're going to go talk to his mama at two. Yeah. We're going to go and ask his ex-girlfriend from high school at four. Then we're going to go and ask his former <laughs> best friend at five. The same sets of questions, right. you know, because we don't believe black people when they tell things. Mm -hmm. Two very recent uh, documentaries um, have produced some troubling uh, images and responses. Uh, the, the documentary about Michael Jackson, four-hour documentary uh, that was uh, on display at Sundance uh, regarding his accusers. Um, people were so troubled by that. Some people actually walked out. They couldn't take it. And then, of course, the recent documentary about R. Kelly and the, the uh, victims of his alleged predatory activities. What does it say that these things are coming out now that these things which kind of have been known or suspected are now coming out and what does it say about uh, how, how we view the victims in these cases? Uh, let's begin with uh, Dr. Nicole if we could. Uh, full disclosure, I, I haven't seen the Michael Jackson documentary at all. Um, but with regards to R. Kelly, um, we had a conversation earlier I think for me what it shows is the expendability of black women to the black community and how willing people are willing to kind of throw away the stories of these black women and girls uh, because, you know, for whatever reason, to protect black men, to protect celebrity, I'm not quite sure if it's one or both of those things, but you realize 
pretty quickly how we kind of throw away these girls as if they, um, as if they, they, they can't be believed and they don't require protection. Uh, and we know that there's all these stereotypes about black women that have been, you know, passed on, Jezebel stereotype, you know, the sexually lascivious black woman who's so sexually aggressive, therefore she doesn't d require any protection. You know, so for me, the, the R. Kelly documentary really kind of hit home um, how expendable we are, or how expendable black women and girls are. And it makes me also think of um, Hazel Carby's piece in, um, oh gosh, I'm losing the title, but she said, uh, she notes in colonial literature, they said that black slave women were supposed to willingly submit themselves to their masters. Think about this. You were supposed to willingly lay down for someone and submit to them. So. It's, it's this kind of oxymoron, where you're supposed to give him what he wants, but he, he has all control over your body anyway. So therefore, we don't need to protect you because you're supposed to do this anyway. So for me, I'm, I, I was really appalled by kind of the community, at least on social media, let's put it this way, social media's response to it like, oh, they're just trying to make money. You know, we can't believe them. Uh, that was disturbing for me, um, but also what was disturbing is the complicity of the black women who were still going to his events. I mean, shortly thereafter, he had an event and there were all kind of women all over, just hanging all over him. And I was just like, didn't you see this documentary? Don't you want to at least keep a comfortable distance until you know for sure? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, a, I'm a perplexed by it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I... I my, I should also, in full disclosure, my mother is a huge Michael Jackson fan, and she would like literally be super mad at me if I didn't say that the Michael Jackson treatment to me reveals that just when black women are finally telling a story, here comes some other thing that uses or manipulates the same platform to tell a story for white people, and one that hasn't been. Uh, in the same degree, it's just like went to court twice. You know, it's like a bunch of other things on it that it makes me think, oh, what a travesty that all of these black girls and women in this documentary over like six episodes did this already and how quickly the platform is being used to tell somebody else's maybe believable story. Mm -hmm. um, and it gets at Sundance versus Lifetime, you know, just even the platform of where you land. And I think with the R. Kelly uh, dynamic, uh, that one I find to be a bit more generative as a black person because it really does get at a larger uh, issue that remains under discussed because R. Kelly can do what he does because it's been perfected by generations of predators amongst black people for generations, you know, and part of what winds up happening there is that even his pattern, and we were discussing this earlier, is what was striking to me was one, his pattern is like all black women. All black women, all black girls. And oftentimes, one of the narratives we learn with celebrity black men is that there are white women everywhere. But he strategically knows that this is the population that is the easy pickings of all of them because nobody's going to check for them. And then when they tell, nobody's going to believe them. Not even their own family members are going to believe them. And not only are they not going to believe them, but they're going to be happy people stepping in the name of love until, you know, they cannot anymore. And I think that says something about, you know, what matters more, the music or the people? How, in, how, are, how does the support of the music provide the infrastructure for the, the predator? Because he's doing it based on money on top of that. Um, and so I, I think that the documentary to me revealed that we have a lot of work to do uh, as a people to really think about who we think deserves to be protected, who we think deserves to be believed, because part of what winds up happening, and I think the R. Kelly documentary really reveals this, is that the narrative about black men being under 
you know, deep, deep, deep extinction, extinction watch has been effective. Because what you see is like a knee-jerk response always to be like, but why it has to be him? What about Harvey Weinstein? What about all these other people? It's like, though, them too. Okay, mm -hmm. hashtag, them too. You know, like, <laughs> it's not an either or, all of them, you know, mm -hmm. can get the all same kind of treatment. Yeah. But it starts to be like, well, it's, isn't it so interesting that R. Kelly is getting all of this attention and so-and-so isn't, and so-and-so isn't. It's like, or it could just be that R. Kelly's a rapist. Like, what if we just talked about the facts of <laughs> right. the matter? Right. And also, more importantly, I think the documentary does something a little bit more important that challenges us as black people to rethink about girls' and women's sexuality, is that they're not just 16, they're not just 12, they're not just 14, but as it progresses post, you know, trial, they're 19 and older. We learn that they're 32, formally married. We learn at 35 that it isn't, I think, it, it would be dangerous just to be thinking about it as like, oh, let's just watch out for young black girls. It's just the whole trajectory. As I was saying, in some ways, playfully, playfully but seriously, the way that documentary demonstrates, if your grandmama is vulnerable, he could get her, you know. If your great-grandmama is at his concert and she's vulnerable in the mind, he will get her. And no one will believe her. The Chicago PD, which knocks down doors on a daily in violation of all sorts of Miranda rights all the time, they're out there with these parents who are like, we have not seen our daughter in three years. This is a private residence. You know, there are rules. We don't want to get in trouble. I just couldn't help but imagine, what if there was a white girl behind those doors? Like, would they have not just dispensed with all sorts of warrant needs and just sort of found out later because the end would have justified the means? Like, the idea of getting in there and getting, you know, poor Elizabeth out of the inside of that house and illustrating her parents that she's still alive and having that powerful moment as police officers would have been worth all of the write-ups, would have been worth all of the legal briefs, all of the lawsuits. That it says also to me that black women don't matter and too many people also are hip to that game. So they're even more victims to all sorts of kind of predators because it's, it's public knowledge apparently. You know, like, want to get away with something? Do it on a black woman's body. Want to not get in trouble for something? Do it with black parents involved. You know, it's just like, oh, people don't care about the black family, they don't care about black children. And if people are doing this to black girls and women, we should also know they're doing it to black boys and men. You know, we just won't get those stories because those come with a little bit more pressure, I guess, or a little bit more secrecy. That we should really think about how our culture of silence really produces these kinds of predators who, when you get magnified by celebrity and money, you could just do it at such a like, it's like capitalism, you know, all the way up. He could just put it at such a high level, you have employees, you have staff members, just this whole conspiracy to allow this kind of behavior that then people just dance, you know? Yeah. Dr. Sargent. Sure. <clears throat> you know, I, I want to add to to this discussion of, um, of the history of not believing black women. And I'm reminded of the 90s when a number of black women spoke out against um, black men and black celebrities and people called them liars. And again, defended, you know, and, and made all these claims um, then. Um, and I'm thinking of Mike Tyson and others again. And you know, later we found out things are very different. But um, I, it, it is interesting how people again discredit the women. And again, nothing <coughs> then against the man, you know, the black man. In this case, R. Kelly. And um, so, you know, I do think it is. It's a terrible thing. One of the things I mentioned, um, you know, briefly in the back was, at some point, I'm wondering. Um, how and when the black community will have this discussion of how we deal with men like him and our families. Because again, perhaps we don't necessarily want to throw him away, but at the same time, he's hurting the community. He's a predator. Right. Right. And so he can't, you know, we, we have to figure out, you know, again, what to do with the R. Kelly's. Yeah. All right. Okay, now I'd like to open it up to our audience for some questions and answers. If anyone has uh, a question that they would like to pose to our panel regarding uh, African Americans in Los Angeles, in the United States, around the world, recent history, current, current day, there's a microphone right there. Please come on up. I'd like for you to address the numbers game that could make a difference. Uh, Dr. Ricks, you talked about the three black council members. Uh, the city of LA has had two opportunities to actually uh, have citizens um, involved in drawing the lines. And that was the message they tried to give those of us who served. There are too many of you and we're gonna break it down. 
but we serve more than people look like us. That sounds like 45. And so we have experienced people, so let's play the numbers game of making sure we can be there. Assemblyman Mike Davis made it possible for our brothers and sisters who are in the middle California area and the rural areas who are being counted there for resources to be counted here. And so I'd like for you to talk about how we play the numbers game and make it work for us. Because in the past they had been counted in the census counter. We have that coming up in 2020. And we need to be very serious not only about claiming them, but about claiming the entire African diaspora. So please talk to that because that's an action item that can bring resources to the Los Angeles area quickly. In terms of, uh, thank you, uh, Jackie. Uh, uh, and let me say this, uh, you know, Jackie DuPont Walker has, uh, you know, always been my, my shero. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I worked under her great toolage, so I'm going to respond to that question in kind. <laughs> Uh, you know, first of all, it is, it is a numbers game. One of the things uh, the African American elected officials have been able to do that um, others have learned is represent everyone. You're absolutely correct. African Americans have learned to not only represent the African American community in terms of delivering uh, goods and services and, and providing resources, but they've also been able to represent the Latinx community uh, uh, Asian Pacific Islander community, uh, Native American community, and all communities within Los Angeles. And, and that happened early on, in, in, in around about <coughs> night, in the early 1970s. Um, the Bradley Coalition that, 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 that held together over 20 years, from 1973 to 1993, was a coalition primarily of African Americans, Jews, and to a lesser extent, Latinos and Asian, uh, and Asian Americans. So, so that rainbow coalition, as it was uh, and deemed and, 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 and entitled, uh, governed Los Angeles for 20 years. And I think that uh, the uh, overrepresentation that we have, I think, is kind of oxymoronic overrepresentation. Uh, the fact that we have three African American members of a 15-person city council speaks to continued. Uh, delivery of goods and services to people regardless of, uh, of hue. And that's one of the things that African American elected officials have been able to do is represent everyone because of a uh, shared history of o oppression and, and marginalization and et cetera, uh, uniquely uh, qualified to be uh, representatives. And moving forward, uh, uh, I, I believe that uh, if, in fact, uh, the electorate and two other things come together, I think there is a, uh, there's potential for uh, another black mayor in the city of Los Angeles. I want to reference the bill back in the legislature in 2011. <coughs> my bill, AB 420, dealt with the end of prison gerrymandering in the state of California. We had a practice in count, counting the census where those individuals who were in prison were counted in areas where they were incarcerated as opposed to where they lived in opposition to California law. Uh, code 2025 of the California Code says that if an individual goes to prison, and by the way, the average term of a prisoner is two to three years, and the census on the other hand is done every 10 years, so when we were counting individuals in Tehachapi and all of those other areas where prisoners are, those communities were reaping the benefits of the federal dollars that go towards services for those individuals in those areas. And when people would go to Fresno or to Tehachapi and see a beautiful regional park and look at the numbers of people that live in the area, they wanted to know how, in fact, could they be able to afford it. And that was how. That becomes critically important when we draw legislative lines, and I know that Commissioner Jackie Walker was very key in the leadership of helping to draw the lines in this area. But when we look at areas in assembly districts, for example, in South LA, uh, we look at Reginald Jones Sawyer's seat has dwindled now from South LA, now moving further east. But however, if we were to count appropriately <coughs> those prisoners who live in South LA who might be away temporarily, then when they come back home for federally funded programs, those programs will have the resources for them. 
currently where we were mispracticing, as I say, then if they come home and it's a federally funded alcohol and drug program, because they are only gone two to three years for eight to seven years, we don't have funding to give them the appropriate sources, resources for which they are uh, entitled on one hand. And secondly, we have then the um, exclusion of potential African American uh, seats. So prison gerrymandering, we were one among many states, New York, uh, Delaware and Maryland ended it, and California has also ended it, but we have to definitely be persistent in making sure that we get the appropriate count during the census as we talk about the growth and development of the African American presence in our communities. Anyone else from the audience want to raise a question? I think for purposes of time as we're getting longer into the evening, we want to keep our responses to two minutes. I've been a little um, liberal on that. Excuse so. me. Yeah, uh, Dr. Ricks mentioned uh, the migration uh, in the South from the South, a lot of people coming from South to the West. One of the things that uh, I have observed is that in the early years, there was a strong migration, as you indicated, <clears throat> from the South to the West for better jobs and so forth. So what I'm seeing now is a trend now from the migration from the West to the south, and that's having an impact on gentrification, on our schools, and uh, so I'd like to ask the question, how can we stem this? What can your educational uh, institutions, or any, what can we do to provide that, uh, that, uh, that stopping of the migration from the west to the south? Because again, it's, Im it's impacting immigration, people are selling their homes and moving back to the South, and it's having a cultural impact also. That's my question. There's a great book written by this, by this sister. She's a journalist. Uh, she, uh, her name is uh, Isabel Wilkerson. She wrote The Warmth of Other Sons, mm -hmm. and she talks about moving and migration patterns. And I interestingly enough, um, you know, people move for economic opportunity. That's the basis, that's why people move. People move for economic opportunity. People move to either gain an economic opportunity or to preserve an economic opportunity. So I'm not really sure um, what that essentially means for African Americans. But as we see the baby boomer generation in retirement, as we see uh, uh, Gen Xers uh, behind them, um, as we look at pension systems around the country and their, uh, um, the, the solvency of these pension systems around the country, you know, a number of pension systems around the country are, 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 are in trouble. As we look at this, you know, this kind of dictates, uh, you know, where people are going to move. Uh, this dictates whether or not um, the, 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 the children whose parents worked hard and and were able to purchase homes, and those children grew up in those homes, it will determine whether or not those children will, will, will keep and maintain those homes. So I think the economy has a lot to do with it. And today, if I'm not mistaken, there's an economic indicator that's really startling and troubling. Oh, yeah. And one of those economic indicators is automobile on default, defaults on automobile loans, right? Now, People pay their car notes before they pay anything else. Why? Because car notes allow you to go to work. Uh, car notes allow you to take care of whatever matters you need to take care of. And worst case scenario, uh, you know, if in fact you have no place else, you can sleep in your car. Now, we have the highest default rate on car notes than we've had in America right now today. And so that means that there is a uh, recession looming. Now, the question becomes, well, in this era that's been suggested there's been, you know, economic boom and, 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 and jobs are, uh, we have a positive job rate and the job rate is inclining and unemployment is, 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 is extremely low. What does that essentially mean for communities of color? That, that, that's the question that really, really uh, unsettles me and says that, you know, there is, um, uneasiness and unreadiness on the horizon. Okay. Yeah, yes, go ahead. Oh, in, in terms of uh, kind of stemming African Americans leaving the state, at least from 
again, I do everything from education. Uh, in the state of California, we graduate about half a million students per year. Of that number, only 8,000 African Americans are even eligible to apply to the Cal State system or the UC system. And so you think about, if we're using education as a means to get those economic opportunities, we are already at, we're in a perilous situation. And so I think um, one of the things, especially, and you reference public schools uh, being so poor, in terms of the quality of those schools, that African American parents really need to be more involved in making sure that they're, you know, even with the public schools, what can you do to supplement your kids' education? What can you do to make sure that they're getting all the requirements that are necessary to get into these institutions so that they can get these jobs? So there's this kind of caretaker situation is happening with education where parents are passing on passing their kids into the system but they're not communicating with the teachers on a regular basis I taught in LA Unified for three years and I probably can count on my hand how many parents regularly called me so that kind of disconnect from your child's education and wonder why your child might be struggling you know a teacher is going to respond to a, a parent that shows up. We can't help but do it. And that's the same even in universities. When I have parents, which is rare because of FERPA law, you know, that protects their privacy, but when the student signs away privacy rights and that parent is there on a regular basis, I gotta respond to them. So I think that we have to use some agency with regards to education and participate in our kids' education more. <coughs> Yeah, I would, uh, on the point of uh, what to do, I would uh, look to housing as uh, an area for uh, some forward motion uh, on this particular issue. Uh, two ways, uh, one is uh, the FHA uh, uh, mortgage in terms of the, uh, the ceiling on the price of a house that you can get based on your credit score at different threshold is not aligned with the actual cost of living of Los Angeles. So if you are a middle class black professional trying to let's say uh, keep Lamert black, let's just make that an uh, easy policy, <laughs> that it becomes difficult to use the government mortgage uh, loan opportunity because maybe it maxes out at $700,000. You're not going to be able to get in to the neighborhood using that mechanism. So one, it's about making the FHA policy align with the, the sort of urban living standards of the actual place as opposed to what tends to happen is the more uniform measurement around like, oh, this is what you get no matter what city you're in. Uh, the second thing is is I think a larger national concern, and that is uh, there is a uh, primacy and privilege put on home ownership, except everybody can't own a home. You know, like uh, it's, it's weird that there isn't like a renter's bill of rights, you know, that everyone who owns a home doesn't live in a home, thus needs <coughs> renters, bless you, and the renters don't have any rights. You know, you can't, you know, use your uh, uh, rent as uh, a taxable or a tax deductible item, mm -hmm. even though the landlord can use you as that. And so it's also just to say that a lot of home ownership is predicated on a renter class that is in many ways disappeared from the tax policy. And so as a result, not only can you not afford a house, but then the rent you're going to pay, you know, in a place like LA, you pay $200,000 in rent, you know, like, and you can't claim it on your taxes. You can't, you know, use it to tell, you know, Comcast, keep the cable on. You can't use it to the student loan people to say, look at all this money I'm paying in rent. No one cares. And the only people who are winning are the homeowners. And most, as we know in our history, most times black people are not the homeowner class or a part of, as they call them, the gentry class. So I think it's about creating a mechanism through the government that allows for people who are qualified to get higher, uh, higher cost homes. And two, the renters need to be protected as a tax policy. Kenneth Weirich, and my question, since we're talking about economics, what's the economics of a student going to college now or to a university? And then what are the career paths? How are your departments and um, the schools actually helping them matriculate into actual jobs or entrepreneurial opportunities? 
Yeah, I, the students that we get uh, in, at UCLA and AFM, they come from all walks of life uh, and have all sorts of interests. So uh, it's an uh, entertainment industry city, which I've learned I'm a, a, a transplant from Philadelphia. So I've learned that it's a real industry and people really want to be in it. And <laughs> so you get students, for example, uh, which would look a little different in another you know, state or another kind of place where the entertainment industry isn't as important. So you get students who want to be screenwriters, you know, students who want to be actors, students who want to make films, students who want to be activists, students who you know, want to be professors, students who want to be teachers, lawyers, doc, that sort of thing. And so I think you know, this is where a, a department like Africana studies or African American studies or black studies or African studies really does service the students because that applies no matter what you decide to do. You know, if you don't know nothing about yourself, you can't do nothing for us or for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so part of what happens there is that we wind up, I think, providing on our campuses the source, sometimes the sole source of a diverse you know, curriculum. Mm -hmm. That it's through us, you know, most of the people who are graduating have some kind of interaction or interface with the black experience or with the idea of diaspora, because white people don't call their movement diaspora. You know, they, just say we're Italian Americans or whatever, you know. Um, and so I would say it's a mixture of students who come from a range of places that primarily need to know what their history is uh, and then go with that into all sorts of fields. So I've worked with students who become, you know, law students, who become lawyers. I've worked with students who become activists or were activists who then use the education to go forward. I have students who are now in the entertainment industry. At UCLA, you also get celebrity students, you know, so your dad is Snoop dog, you know, and so, you know, you're in college for, you know, all sorts of reasons. Um, and so I think uh, what, we're wind what we're seeing is that people are not necessarily going in the traditional path that people think about, you know, you're going to go into this profession and do these things. But I think with a discipline like Africana studies or African American studies or any one of these kind of ethnic studies, it's even more important because people are going into the world of media you know, oftentimes. And that's broadly defined now, you know, all sorts of platforms that they need to be educated so that you know blackface is just a no-no. You know, like that just always says to me the lack of education mm -hmm. and the reason why departments like ours need to be at every university because then you won't have to wait until the person is a 50-year-old, you know, governor of Virginia to find out that that's not a good look at the very least, let alone actually uh, the best kind of politics. Well, at, at Dominguez, the students who come, particularly African American students, their standard, um, I guess their socioeconomic status changes pretty dramatically overall because they, at Dominguez, we get a lot of the students that people would assume at, at other institutions would be throwaway students. And so, and then they come to our department and we give them this, founda this educational foundation, but we also let them know that they matter. And from there, we kind of tailor it to their interests. One good thing about Dominguez, I will say, and I've only been there for two years, is we have a thing called an innovation incubator, which creates social entrepreneurs, people who are going to try to build a business but do something good in the community as well. So on Friday, for example, we have a black health entrepreneurship forum where people who have been making healthy food in the community and doing, creating an autism resource for African-American parents, the students get, are getting exposure to, the, to these different types of fields that they probably wouldn't. And fortunately, the person who's in charge is an African-American man who's run successful businesses, so he can really talk to them. And he's from the area, so he can really talk to them about where they can find opportunities. So we don't try to peg them into a particular type of job. We just try to give them as much exposure. And then we also require them to do an internship so they can kind of take what they learn in the class and apply it somewhere. I think over the last several years, there's been a move in education, especially at the two and four year, um, maybe particularly more at uh, CSUs, for students to um, go through school or get through school faster, and so and not spend as much time. For instance, um, some years ago, the average time of a community college student that they would spend at a community college was six years, which is long. Um, but the um, the problem with that is now they're being forced and pushed into into fields that perhaps 
you know, later they may change their mind. And so we find a lot of students moving away from the liberal arts and, you know, at, well, more toward education, which is a good thing. But um, I, I think the problem is, is that they're not given enough time to explore and to think deeply about what they actually want to do or what they, you know, or what they can do. And, you know, they're more or less pushed into things and um, so that they can get out faster. So, yeah. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. How about a hand for our panel? I have two things we want to do. I want to do closing remarks with David Price, who is the community director for the office of the mayor, one of our uh, one of the mayor's deputies who uh, represents him in the community. Uh, why don't you come up, David, and give us some final uh, comments? And then I have a presentation I'd like to do on behalf of the mayor. Wow, that was a great conversation. So first, I just want to say thank you uh, for your, your thoughts and your, your words that you offer for us tonight. And on behalf of Mayor Eric Garcetti and the entire city of Los Angeles, I just want to give you all another round of applause from an awesome <laughs> event and roundtable discussion about black migration and the ways in which we are all affected by it. Uh, thank you to the Author Study Club, of course, Commissioner Mike Davis, thank you, sir, and these amazing panelists. Um, and I just want you all to remember that in Los Angeles, we don't only, as Mayor Garcetti says, we don't only uh, mark history, but we make history. And this conversation should move far beyond this room here as we go into the world connecting and being bridges between our ivory institutions and the streets of Los Angeles. And so I want this discussion to not only be a discussion, but to actually turn into strategies and policies that affect the ways we live in this city. So thank you again, and I look forward to more kinds of conversations like this in the future. Thank you, David.